the guy has a good mind, cunning burning, great player, master of Formula One. This is what automobile and other publications have called this man for the last quarter of a century. And these characteristics very accurately reflect his amazing journey from a junior Formula racer and team manager to the main arbiter of the destinies of Formula One. It will seem the classic formula, at first glance an inconspicuous gentleman who, however, has perseverance and business acumen, but at the same time a romantic in the depths of the soul, whose heart turned to stone from the loss of comrades. Who exactly is this mysterious Bernie? It's no secret that Ecclestone is called the child of Great Depression. They say that almost all people of his generation experience some kind of mystical craving for money. Let's not argue. Bernard Charles Ecclestone was born two years after Black Friday, October 28, 1930, into the family of a fish and trowel skipper in the town of St. Peter's on the east coast of England, in Suffolk. So, you really can't call his childhood cloudless and happy. No indoor toilets and things. And I, think, I don't remember when we had electricity or not. Certainly we didn't in my grandmother's house, but maybe later on we did. I think it was 1936, your family moves to a home in Bom Alley on the outskirts of uh, London. How concerned were you guys at that time about the potential of an air raid? Quite excited about the whole thing, it's all different. And when the war was on because of a lot of bombing and where we lived, you know, every night there was air raids and things. So we lived in an air raid shelter. Bernie made his first money by selling raising bonds to his classmates. After leaving school at 15, he decided to study as engineer and enter at Woolwich Polytechnic in London. But the chemical engineering specialist died at Ecclestone before he was born. Even as a child, he identified his future field of activity – business. He started his business by selling used bicycles. Fortunately, the ordinary merchant from Bernie didn't turn out either, and all because as a teenager he tried to ride a sports motorcycle. And he fell in love with racing. This activity, however, requires money, and the more, the higher the level. At first, the office of Bernie's trading company was located in his mother's kitchen. But soon, Ecclestone opened a store selling bicycles, motorcycles and spare parts in the southern London superb of Bexley Heath. Increased income allowed Ecclestone to take up serious racing. In 1951, he ordered a Formula Junior car, the predecessor of the current F3, with a 500cc Norton motorcycle engine from the father and son company Cooper. And in addition to the club and amateur championships, he began to start in the newly organized British Professional Championship. But for season brought nothing but a serious crash in September 1951 at Brass Hatch, and fifth place two years later in the London Cup in Formula 2 Cooper T23 Bristol. At the age of 23, Bernie realized that he won't become a great racer. And although even before the beginning of the 60s, Ecclestone's name was something found in the starting protocols of various circuit competitions, he himself was intensely looking for his own way to the top, no longer behind the wheel of a racing car. You know, that's all they did. I was a used car dealer. Mm. So, got in a race car occasionally. If somebody decided they just wanted to race occasionally in a Formula 1 event and have a little chance. And the businessman from Bernie turned out to be excellent. The results speak about this. The store in Bexley Head was expanding, the trading company Copton & Ecclestone was getting rich. However, the passion for the racing industry didn't subside. While still a Formula Junior's driver, Ecclestone met and soon became close friends with Stuart Lewis Evans. Almost the same age, both small in stature, otherwise the young people were complete opposites. Quite an unassuming Stuart was transformed behind the wheel. English newspapermen vied with each other to predict a brilliant career for him. 
And very soon Lewis Evans began to justify the advances given to him. In the meantime, Burning offered his friend his help and became his manager. It was an unforgettable time, Eccleston somehow became emotional. Time of romance and chivalry. What a race it was, and what people, great race risked their lives every day. But at the same time, they smiled and helped each other without any thought of reward. Just think, this world belonged to Bernie. Bernie! This future millionaire and then already a very resourceful businessman fussed around Lewis Evans like a carry hand, carrying bottles, cups, cans of milk everywhere with him. Stuart had a stomach ulcer. In September 1957, the English company Connaught, which took part in the Formula One World Championship, went bankrupt and Bernie purchased two Model B racing cars with Alta engines at a sale. In 58, while Lewis Evans was working out his contract at Vanville, Bernie was running his team in home races in Britain, and twice risking appearing at the start of the Grand Prix. In Monaco, Bruce Kessler and Paul Emery unsuccessfully tried to qualify and angered the boss so much that Eccleston got behind the wheel himself. Almost without any success. But at Silverstone in July he showed the last 21st time and, of course, didn't start. Both Bernie drivers started the race, but retired before even a third of distance. The outdated low-power Conant B didn't pose a real threat to Ferrari, Vanwall and Cooper. Bernie didn't even think about losing heart. He was already looking forward to the next season, when Lewis Evans will take up the start of the World Championship driving the latest Cooper. There were only a dozen laps left to finish the American Grand Prix on October 19, 1958, in Casablanca when Lewis Evans entered a fast corner. At that moment, the connecting rod broke and the engine ceased. The wheels locked, Van Wall lost control and flew off the road. The car crashed into trees and gas tank hit a road sign and exploded. Stuart Lewis Evans died from his burn six days later. So, without having time to open up, Eccleston's romantic disappeared into oblivion. Because with the death of his friend, Bertney decides that he had enough of auto racing. The price to pay for big races is too high and 37-year-old Eccleston plunged headlong into business. For eight years, Bernie honestly proved to himself that he could completely do without motorsport in general and Formula One in particular. But he couldn't forget the big races. And by 1965, at the instigation of his good friend, the famous English driver of 50s and 60s, Roy Salvadori, he became the manager of the promising young Austrian, Jochen Rind. For six years, tricky Bernie, as he had already begun to be called in the Formula One paddock, led a talented and obstinate driver from Cooper to Brabham and then Lotus, arguing with team owners newly appeared sponsors and steadily increasing his charges fee. The idol ended on September 5, 1970, when Ring crashed to death during training for the Italian Grand Prix. This time Bernie made no vows to leave out racing. He became 12 years older, much richer and had long ago gotten rid of his romantic nature. From then on, Ecclestone will become tough and extremely pragmatic in dealing with drivers. He couldn't stand it if any of them had a business advisor. If a driver promised to send his manager for negotiations, I replied that he won't ride in my team. I don't need guys who don't have their own head on their shoulders to talk to the employer. Agree. There is a little left in this man from Bernie passing around Lewis Evans with a bottle of warm milk. At the end of 1971, Bernie purchased the English Brabham team from its creator Ron Darnock for 100,000 shillings and already in January 1972 he was pouring tea at his first meeting of F1 Constructors Association. 
Less than a year had passed since Mr. Ferguson lost his post and a certain Peter McIntosh, who still managed a team of aerial acrobats, was selected as the head of F1CA on the advice of Eccleston. Of course, the new president, who had no experience in Formula 1, listened carefully to what his benefactor Tricky Bernie told him. And our hero very soon became too tight for the team manager's class, having become the most successful leader in the history of the Brabham team. A businessman to the core, Eccleston immediately realized what a gold mine Formula 1 could become. Advertising, television, in the mid 70s, the commercialization of sports was just beginning should have shed real money rain over the world of big prizes. But to get under it, you must in any case be first among equals. When simple interest ends and business begins, he will say later, it's necessary to keep the situation under control very tightly. Words that explain a lot not only about the character of Tricky Bernie, but also about the history of Formula 1 in the era of Ecclestone. On January 6, 1978, F1CA's press release read, Bernie Ecclestone has been appointed Chief and Staff and Chief Executive Officer. Mr. Enzo Ferrari is the Sporting Director, Mr. Max Mosley as the Legal Counsel. So, Bernie climbed to the top. Now he faced the most difficult thing – to stay on it. The first thing the new president did was change the name. Instead of F1CA, FOCA. The name was a trifle. Much more serious questions lay ahead. First of all, television. Bernie was one of the first in motorsport to understand the importance of the electronic press. And, most important, television advertising. Ecclestone managed to convince Focus that the rights to television broadcasts should belong only to it. And money immediately appeared – hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. And who has money can set conditions? Previously, prices started in months depending entirely on the organizers of the Grand Prix. Now all financial issues, the size of the bonuses, and even the cost of drivers when moving from one team to another were determined by FOCA, which also decided uh, which tracks were worthy of hosting the Grand Prix. So the organizers of the Grand Prizes of Spain in Jarama and the USA in Long Beach, who didn't agree with Bernie on the amount of payments, were immediately removed from the list of organizers of the World Championship stages. The difficult character of the FOCA president, his solid authoritarian nature, often became the cause of not only painful clashes with various people, but also major mistakes. And once they even threatened the very existence of Formula One. In the early 80s, Eccleston tried to free himself from the tutelage of the International Motorsports Federation, then FISA, under whose auspices all world championships are held. At the head of FISA was Jean-Marie Balestre, a man who, in terms of character, will give anyone a hundred points ahead. In Formula 1, a real war broke out between FISA and FOCA. You can watch video about these events on my channel that names a uh, battle for golden eggs. Intrigue and behind-the-scenes struggle continued for more than a year. However, Ballester managed to enlist the support of not only some FOCA members, including Enzo Ferrari, but also, most importantly, the almighty Formula One sponsors. Shell, Marlboro, Goodyear and others were clearly not happy about the split in such a profitable advertising business and Ecclestone had to lay down his arms. Many decided that he wouldn't recover from such a blow for a long time. But it wasn't there. Connie and Bernie instantly changed tactics. From an implacable enemy, Molester became his most active assistant and vice president of FISA. In the FISA presidential election in October 1991, Molester was removed from office. The Frenchman's successor was Ecclestone's closest associate, mostly. 
The Bremen team was sold in 1987 for 5 million dollars. By this time, Bernie decided to devote himself entirely to manage all areas of Formula One. The same year, Bernie created a company known as Formula One Management, which received 23% of revenue from televised races and also provided money for prizes for teams and drivers. In 1995, the Formula One group of companies was established, responsible for all commercial activities of the championship. It included the management company FOM and Formula One administration. Bernie became the CEO of both organizations. In 1999, Eccleston underwent heart surgery, after which he had a plan to sell Formula One while maintaining full control. A buyer was found in 2001. It was media tycoon Leo Kerr. In total, Kerr spent more than $2 billion on Formula One. Most of this money was borrowed. And when Leo went bankrupt, the Formula papers were sent to his creditors, German banks. The bankers tried to introduce their representatives into the management structures of Formula One, but nothing worked out for them. In 2016, Bernie sold Formula One for the second time. The new owner of American Liberty Media, after completing the deal, hastened to dismiss Eccleston. According to Bernie himself, he didn't have a large management pyramid in Formula One, and perhaps this is one of the keys to his success. In one of the interviews, the former head of Formula One told the decision he considers the best in life. It was the decision to start all Formula One races on Sundays at the same time, allowing broadcasters to schedule their broadcasts. Until the 70s of the last century, Formula races started at different times and took place on different days of week. Because of this, they were rarely shown. The complete transition to a fixed start time of 2 p.m. European time made it possible to Augustown fans to watch races at the same time and help TV channels to include Formula One on a permanent basis in their broadcast schedule. Bernie Ecclestone gave us the Formula One that we know to this day, taking it beyond the boundaries of the European Grand Prix and turning it into a global one. Yep. Having brought Formula One from the category of sports competition to the level of one of the most exciting car shows on the planet, Bernie Eccleston also turned racing into a successful business project. And this shouldn't be underestimated, because he always conducted negotiation on holding the Grand Prix in different countries directly with presidents prime ministers and representatives of royal families, without intermediaries. Thus, Ecclestone signed his first contract to host the Australian Grand Prix back in the 80s, meeting with the then Prime Minister of South Australia John Bannon in the chic star pub in Chessington. Before Ecclestone took over the leadership of Formula One, these races were held irregularly and at the almost major level. Each racing team negotiated its own contracts with promoters. In 1981, the situation changed dramatically. Ecclestone convinced the team to sign a contract known as a Concord, obliging the teams to take part in every race. This meant that F1 organizers could, from then on, offer guaranteed coverage to television networks. Of course, Bernie, like any other person, had run and even successful decisions such as holding the Grand Prix in India, cancelling the qualifying race and replacing them with a draw, the Olympic scoring system, when points were counted only for the prize-winning three places. Probably the top one bad decision is Bernie's decision to lead the team to the same engine manufacturer. Can you imagine what Ferrari's indignation would be like? And it seems that in order to make such balanced and deliberate decisions, and indeed to own such an empire as Formula One, you need to be an insensitive and very strict person. But Bernie isn't like that at all. I hope that now I can surprise you. If anyone is afraid of Bernie, it's in vain, mostly one said. He's actually a very kind person. Indeed, very kind. 
and the great jokers Eddie Jordan claims. One day, four days before the start of the race, I received a fax from Bernie saying that I had been rejected from the race. Taking this message at face value, I spent a sleepless night. In the end, it turned out that it was a joke. However, this prank was a clear, if real example of Bernie's ability to keep the situation under control. Of course, he sent me fax not only for fun. In fact, he was demonstrated who is the real boss in Formula 1. Eccleston is truly a caring owner. When the same journey had financial difficulties, Burton came to rescue and paid the Irish stable the rights to television broadcast in advance. But he's also a gentle father. Tom Wetcraft, the owner of the Donington Park track, still remembers with emotion how Bernie once called him at 3 in the morning and asked how much he was willing to pay to host the European Grand Prix of the 1993 season at his English circuit. And then he started asking about children's medicine. The youngest daughter, Petra, she was four years old at that time, had a tummy ache. Moreover, Bernie always had a warm attitude towards the races, unlike the same Jean-Marie Balestra, whose favorite was Alan Prost. Without a doubt, this added fuel to the fire in the battle between Ayrton and Alan. But this is not about that now. Despite the fact that Bernie was against the dominance of Mercedes team and tried to fight it in every possible way, in 2013, he talked about how he himself helped the team with advice. Talking to the team management about Lewis, I once said, if you sign a contract with him, you can bring in the right specialist, because they will perceive a Mercedes as a team that seriously aspires to win. Lewis Hamilton, what do you like about him? I think he's the best thing we've had in Formula 1 for a long time. He's colorful, he gets to nearly everyone in the in the, the public, you know. People admire him as a driver, talented and looks a bit different than most of them. In the same interview, Bernie talked about his dream team. Let's start with drivers. Of course, I will choose Sebastian Vettel. I have an excellent relationship with him. And then Fernando Alonso and Lewis Hamilton. Most likely, out of them I will choose the one who will be cheaper. Loud. If we talk about technical specialists, I will look for them at Red Bull. I think everyone will do the same. And I will suggest Christian Horner to lead the team. How would you describe him relative to what you would have thought he would have been like? Well, he was everything that, uh, that I thought he was going to be like. He was sort of like this uh, mafioso character, you know, hugely powerful presence. You know, when he walked into a room, everybody went, went quiet. Um, but then when you get to know the person, he's got the biggest and most extraordinary heart and, and compassion for the, you know, uh, the, that I've ever met in a, a human being. And uh, so there's very much, there's two sides to him. There's the, the hard-nosed business, um, former second-hand car dealer that's made an absolute fortune and built Formula One into what it is. And then there's a guy that, if anybody's in trouble, you know, very, uh, you know, discreetly, he's there to help, you know, with the charity work that isn't um, publicized. I mean, the money he's put into charities like Great Ormond Street and, and, and Wings for Life and stuff like that, isn't it? Incredible. And if I still haven't convinced you of Bernie's good heart, what better way to demonstrate it than his attitude towards animals? When Lewis got Roscoe, he asked Bernie to give the dog a pass to which Bernie responded. He will receive such a pass, I generally like bulldogs. I told you that I will be happy to give such a dog a pass even to the starting field. Loads. I'll be happy to look after Roscoe while Lewis races. By the way, it's worth mentioning that Bernard Eccleston became Bernie only because Eugen Rin started calling him Bernie. Before that, he was Bernard. And if we talk about the love for racers, of course, the group photos that Bernie organized immediately come to mind. In addition to Jochen Rind, Lewis Hamilton, Sebastian Vettel, Rubens Barrichello, 
I would like to tell you about one story of respect and love. Yeah, Bernie Ecclestone wasn't allowed to attend Ayrton's funeral, blaming the formula's management for his death. But it was Bernie who had very warm feelings for Ayrton, the Senate family and Brazil as a whole. There was even a situation when Bernie tried in every possible way to help Bruno Senna to get a worthy place in Formula 1. Unfortunately, he couldn't have much, because at that time Rubens Barrichello was renewed and Bruno received a place in the Hispania team. Now Ecclestone, who turned 93 this year, spent a lot of time on his farm in Brazil and was even started producing his own brand of coffee. Some people consider Eccleston a great man, a genius, someone, an ordinary merchant who turned the most exciting and romantic adventure of the century into a fair book on the electronic cosmic level. Some count Bernie's millions, yachts and mansions. Others are amazed at the 16 hours working day, and everyone sees the own Eccleston, good or evil. And Bernie has its own Formula One. Yeah, his own. Well, the human soul remains a great mystery, a refuge of nobility, honesty and kindness. Even if from the outside it seems that it has long turned into a tightly stuffed wallet.